the story of today is filaments. And we want to know in the comments if you have some aurora parties planned for this weekend. There are two coronal mass ejections headed toward Earth, one slated to hit in just a few hours today on August 4th. We'll tell you all about it here at the Smash News Network. Please busted name in news and congratulations on realizing that the channel exists. This is a 24 hour video from SDO. That is 193 plus 304 angstroms, ionized iron and helium respectively. And like I said, the story of the day is filaments. You might see one down there at the Southern Hemisphere. There are a huge number of filaments currently on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk, and those are known to become coronal mass ejections. Here's a great close-up of that southern crown prominence. A little bit of rapid motions happening there. It looks like it has mostly stayed intact, just repositioning itself a little bit. And here's the equatorial zoom. We do have two new sunspots that just rose in the east. They're both exhibiting a little bit more magnetic complexity than yesterday. Overall, a downtick in solar activity. You might be surprised to hear that. Most active region is in the west. Here is that northeastern new sunspot, and it does have a second large umbra trailing it there. So it is a beta gamma class sunspot, and there is a huge plasma filament trailing that, which we will show you later when we talk about coronal mass ejections. Here's the North Polar region. You can see a big prominence up there in the Northwest also. And what's that? You want to see it more closely? All right, there you go. So there's the full disk zoom, and that is a 24-hour video, by the way. And let's talk about the channel for a brief moment. Don't be an imbecile. Did you know that imbecile is actually an adjective as well as a noun? Yeah, <laughs> imbecile. <laughs> it is an adjective. So in other words, don't be an imbecile imbecile. You could even add imbecile. You could say, don't be an imbecile. Don't be an imbecile, imbecile, imbecile. Of course, there are many imbeciles online, so we make our memes into products. If you'd like it on a hoodie or various other products, check out the Red Bubble Shop. Links below the shop. Thanks to everybody who's picked up merch and everybody who watches these videos and who is not an imbecile. Today's featured product on the Amazon shop at amazon.com slash shop slash smash o mash is B vitamins. Yeah, B vitamins. If I was going to take just one supplement most days, it would just be a B complex. The antioxidant properties. Did you know bad breath can be caused by some vitamin B deficiencies? Yeah, I've, I've heard this. I, I don't know. I haven't read any clinical studies. Again, you can find links below this video to the Amazon shop. Some of the supplements that I take there listed, as well as some other items like spaceware, camping supplies, and save on bulk spices. You can also find links to the Hemp Lucid Shop if you've never checked it out. Or if you are overdue to renew some of your products, maybe check out the Focus Mushroom Gummies, the Stress Mushroom Gummies. I use those quite regularly. Lots of other products available there, again, at the Hemp Lucid Shop. Links below this video, as well as on the homepage at smashomash.com. And welcome to the Neo Renaissance. We launched the smashomash.com website back in February of 2019 in response to ridiculous censorship on a certain social media platform that, were, that will remain unnamed. We saw the writing on the wall and realized we needed to make our own web ring and have the ability to host and post whatever we want smashomash.com is the home page lots of links there also links to the forum you want to read about our mission go to smashomash.com slash forum slash mission you want to click the merch there you go there's a link to the smash team site also we'll talk about that later in the video but first let's talk about sunspots so here is yesterday plus today that is the sdo continuum 
and no major changes in sunspots here. Uh, they're really the most major change is just this large umbra rising behind this northeastern group. Besides that, it's been pretty stable. Again, a downtick here in solar activity since yesterday. We'll talk about it here in a moment after we go over earthquakes and volcanoes. There is yesterday plus today in colorized magnetogram. Again, not a lot of changes happening there on the earth-facing portion of the solar disk at least. It's been pretty stable. Here's the volcano rundown. Sakurajima is now erupting, producing a 6,000-foot ash plume. Mayan, 9,000-foot ash plume over Luzon Island, Philippines. Manam exploding, flight level 070 over Papua New Guinea. Ibu exploding, flight level 060 over Halmahera. East Java featuring some, a volcano I've never heard of. Ijen, intermittent discrete weak volcanic ash emissions producing a 10,000 foot ash plume doesn't sound weak to me it's a flight level 100 there over east java from ijen popocatepetl exploding flight level 200 over central mexico it's a 20,000 foot ash plume no volcanic ash observed over nevado de ruiz colombia Sangay and Ecuador producing a 20,000 foot ash plume as it explodes. It's a flight level 200, flight level 160 over Ravenador, continuous emissions from Sabancaya in Peru, and intermittent emissions from Ubinas. Please don't pull vault the caldera, but do visit our links. And next, earthquakes. So, current situation is moderate levels of activity. And we may be seeing some foreshocks here in the Cascadia Fault Zone. Largest quake of the past 24 was actually off the coast of the Alaskan Peninsula there in the North Pacific. There is a location of that. That was a 5.6 magnitude quake. Largest quake of the past 24 hours was an American quake. That 5.6 occurred at 1933 Universal Time. 1933 Universal Time yesterday evening. So here come the quakes over a 5 magnitude. Not many. So again, there's that 5.6. Columbia had a 5.1. That was at depth. It occurred at 2209 Universal Time yesterday evening. Java, Indonesia had a 5.5. Half an hour after midnight. That was at extreme depth there, over 570 kilometers estimated depth for that Javan quake. And a quick note, check it out. Could those be foreshocks around the Cascadia fault zone? We've been talking about it. The possibility of pre-earthquake signals showing up in the space weather data. We'll cover that later in the video in our bonus segment. Our bonus feature segment, I should say. And let's get back to space. Here's some more imagery from SDO. I think you'll like it. Here's another 24-hour video there. That's the house favorite wavelength, 171 angstroms. This sunspot here looks like it's only alpha class, but there's perhaps a new group rising right here to the north of it. And we are expecting an increase in sunspot activity down here in the southeast. So that's going to come as no surprise. We'll tell you why here in a minute. And let's get to some more statistics here. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux, which is, by the way, directly proportional to sunspot number, now all the way down to 163 solar flux units. So surprisingly low there. It may have to do with all those plasma filaments. 163 is the current 10.7 centimeter radio flux number. And here's a space weather enthusiast dashboard. Again, Aurora parties. Schedule yours for Friday and Saturday nights because we're expecting two coronal mass ejection impacts. Tonight should be pretty well timed for dusk in the U.S. Uh, Saturday nights... Friday nights, tonight's might be a little bit around dusk time when it first arrives. Uh, tomorrow night might be a little bit later. So anyway, just be prepared for that. 
and we'll tell you about how to monitor the possibility of seeing aurora where you're located. So the Space Weather Enthusiast Dashboard, this is NOAA's forecast. NOAA forecasting geomagnetic unrest to begin around 1800 Universal Time this evening. So you can see a second period of geomagnetic unrest there. There were two separate events. And we're expecting the second one to arrive a little bit later than NOAA's forecasting and the first one to arrive a little bit earlier than NOAA's forecasting. So just a few hours away from that first possible coronal mass ejection impact. And if you've signed up for email alerts at smashomash.com slash smash team, you'll get alerts about it when they indeed do arrive. So here are the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space, and it is currently geomagnetically calm conditions on planet Earth. That is our geospace magnetosphere movie depicting magnetohydrodynamic pressure. And it is a low pressure environment according to the space weather modeling framework at the moment. We'll let that play through since it's refreshed. We don't edit these videos to get them onto your screen as quickly as possible. They are extremely timely, the daily space weather videos, part of the reason why they are so costly for us to produce. So that's the past four hours. It is quite calm in terms of solar wind parameters. So here's our ground magnetic perturbations map. This depicts magnetic flux density at the surface level. And this is a great map to forecast the likelihood of seeing the aurora where you are located. So that's the worldview map. And if you are in North America, highly recommend the North American map. So that is really good at showing you if the aurora is going to be likely where you're located. So that's one of the ways. Keep in mind this shows four hours of data. This is one of the ways you can figure out if it's worth going out to try to especially take photographs and video of the aurora. Another great choice is to use some other data sets that we'll show you here. Now, one of the ones that's designed for this is the Space Weather Prediction Center's Auroral Forecast. So that's your 30-minute Auroral Forecast. Pay, please pay attention to the time and date stamps down there in the bottom right. Um, this one's okay at forecasting the aurora, but we've had great success with the previous tab that we showed. So the previous tab, the ground magnetic perturbations map, is superior to this in my opinion. It does show the magnetic, the telluric currents essentially at the Earth level. But this one here I think might even be the best of all because this is going to show, if you are in North America, or at least in the U.S. and Canada, it's going to show you induction into the power grid. So keep in mind these effects happen instantaneously when the induced current arrives. And so this one can be quite up to date. It's actually showing you the empirical uh, amount of voltage induced into the power grid systems. So, And of course you can see that this area over here around the east coast, that's caused by differences in the substrate because differences in Earth's crust and probably mantle, outer, and inner cores do affect the conductivity of the planet, and hence electrical current flows differently through different materials. So that is what's going on there. That is why the, that's why that area is always different. South of that is the coastal plain there. That's south... Uh, South Carolina and Georgia's coastal plain to the south of that different conductivity than the rest of those areas there. So those are the recommendations for the likelihood of Aurora. Um, again, just to recap that, the ground magnetic perturbations map is a good choice. If you're not in North America, you can use the world map or you can even use the polar view. But there's the world map. You can also use the 30-minute aurora forecast. And you can also use this. Uh, this is called the Geoelectric Field Models, U.S. and Canada 1D and 3D empirical
There's a 3D model. I prefer the one with Canada because Canada is so far north it obviously shows a little bit more detail for you there. Current KP index, an average of global geomagnetism, is at 2. KP2 is the current situation. Again, geomagnetically calm. And we've seen some quite weak solar wind here and a change in the instrument. So we were first we were using the Discover back here and then switched to the ACE and then recently switched back to the Discover. So the Discover is returning about four protons per cubic centimeter for the solar wind density. Solar wind speed here about 430 kilometers per second. I would note also that both instruments are showing a significant strengthening of the magnetic fields. So around 7 o'clock universal time this morning, the fields did increase significantly there from 10 to 14 nanotesla, making it as high as 16 nanotesla. Also, the BZ has flipped negative. So that's a that's a that's good for aurora hunters because a negative BZ does induce more current into the Earth system. It's essentially a pull. And so, yeah, 14 nanotesla with a negative 5 BZ is pretty significant there. We may see a little increase in the KP index. I don't anticipate that being the CME impact yet. It is a little too early for that. Uh, we're still a few hours away from the CME impact. But again, we'll keep you posted, especially if you're signed up for email alerts at smashomash.com slash smash team. And did you know that we send out email alerts about videos just like this one? Yeah, it's true. Because if you're relying on certain tech corporations to notify you about the posting of videos, you are being very irresponsible. So why not? Why not? Uh, utilize solutions that have been created to these issues and sign up for email alerts seems like a seems like a no-brainer but hey if you don't want another login and password I don't blame you but did you know that there are password managers that'll save all that stuff for you they're quite secure anyway goes back to tometers here that's the past three days and if you're wondering what these N's and M's mean, they are telling you the position of the satellite. That's noon local time for the GOES-16, and that's midnight local time for the GOES-16. The blue N's and M's are for the GOES-18. They are near geosync they are geo geosynchronous near equatorial satellites. And let's move on to the heliospheric current sheet. So here's some important changes happening. Important changes happening here. We expected a possible South Pole current sheet showing up by today. And that has been, whoops, that has been canceled. So bringing up the latest image here, the North Pole current sheet here extending much longer now. So that is an indication that there perhaps indeed is going to be some growth of that southeastern sunspot or another sunspot rising, or maybe even a weakening of the northeastern sunspot. But one of those three things should be going on. North Pole current sheet here expected to continue possibly for days. Sector boundary crossing now moved way back over there. North Pole current sheet is the current polarity of the heliospheric current sheet. Next is the line of sight field plot. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some sudden changes. There you can see the B field shifting northward there. So North Pole current sheet will continue here. Uh, and again, the predictive value of the top view ecliptic plane field plot is quite extraordinary. Next, moving to coronal holes. And there is the coronal hole line of sight field plot. We've got all North Pole coronal holes on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk, except in the northeastern limb. So there is the, well, the, just the northeastern quadrant, I'll say. So there is that situation, and let's get me off screen and get 211 angstroms on screen. So these are all North Pole coronal holes, except for up here there are some South Pole. And that sector boundary crossing, it is not showing up here. Keep in mind the magnetic environment can change suddenly and with basically no warning. Most well-defined coronal hole down here at the South Polar region. It is of North Pole orientation, as you can see there. 
And you can expect an uptick in coronal holes in the coming days, by the way, because coming days and months, indeed, because we've really had a coronal hole shortage, in my opinion, throughout this solar cycle. And let's move to sunspots. So no major changes here, uh, except maybe for the complexity of sunspot 3395. It is now beta gamma class. It does have a trailing large umbra. And it looks like a new sunspot is rising right here indeed. So we may see this one grow. This one might be a magnetically complex sunspot or both. And let's take a look at sunspots here. First in the SDO continuum. And then we'll show you some fantastic close-ups. So there's SDO continuum. That is yesterday plus today. That's August 3rd and August 4th to date. Some changes happen into this sunspot here. Some evolution there. Some actually some umbral growth there. So that is a that'll represent a slight increase in the sunspot number. Although this this massive group down here that's setting will represent a decrease in the sunspot number. There's a very high likelihood of large solar flares, especially right in this area. So that's where you can expect to see continued activity. Even though the sunspot has set, it still has the possibility to produce an X-class flare or additional M-class events. All right, so next we'll move to our custom videos. This is 1600 angstroms. That's ionized carbon. And that is a 24-hour video. Here's a close-up of the equatorial region. And we've got some extreme close-ups, so let's cut to those. So here are the most likely groups to produce large flares. These groups are by far more likely to produce an X-class flare than any other portion of the sun, save for maybe at the eastern limb. Uh, now we're unable to see a sunspot's magnetic complexity until after it rises, but we know these sunspots are magnetically complex and they are close to the limb. So those are the most likely places to see large flares and you can see some brightening there. That is a surplus of ionized carbon in those regions, probably produced through nuclear fusion or perhaps even nuclear fission and fusion. But in any case, lots of carbon there being produced by whatever process in the extremely hot environment of the lower solar corona. Here is this group in the northeast. Also a good view of those closer to center disk sunspots there. And before we talk, before we show the actual imagery of our favorite flare wavelengths, let's talk about energetic particles. So no SEPs, no solar energetic particle events, no spikes in the ghost proton flux. We've seen that subside following one of the strongest SEPs of Solar Cycle 25 so far and expect more of these to come because, well, these have been a little bit underperforming as well. The X-ray flux here featuring one long duration M-class flare. It was an M1.99, and that occurred. Peak flux was around 4.20 universal time this morning. And here are the, f here's 94 angstroms, a great wavelength through which to view flares. Quick reminder, folks, don't get solar flares and coronal mass ejections confused. They are completely separate phenomenon. A solar flare is photons, in other words, high-frequency photons ionizing radiation in the form of x-rays. Coronal mass ejections are the ejection of gas out of the solar corona. That is protons. So a great way to remember the difference between photons and protons is stand in front of a flashlight. You'll have light shining in your face. Those are photons. Then turn on a fan. You'll have wind blowing in your face. The wind is primarily the mass of protons. Protons and photons, don't confuse them. Coronal mass ejections are protons. Solar flares are photons. Separate phenomenon. Here's the equatorial zoom. 
And that M2 event did come from that region to the north of our Earth scale. And there it is, happening around 4.20 universal time this morning. And here's an extreme close-up for all of you stargazers out there. Thanks for stargazing with us. The most interesting star to gaze at is the closest one. As some people seem to be figuring out the way that thing works in reality. Reality, it is a strange thing. Space, it's a lot stranger than you might think. And if some current theories are the actual scenario that's going on, did you know that stars are probably a lot more stable than mostly anybody believes? It's crazy. It's crazy to report that stars are less volatile <laughs> <laughs> that practically anybody believes. <laughs> okay. So this is what's going on over the sky, over Lehigh Valley in the sky. We encourage our viewers to look up. Here's a star chart for you. And, uh, yeah, we've got a setting gibbous waning moon there and setting Saturn, Jupiter high in the sky here as the sun is only a few degrees off the horizon. That's skyandtelescope.org star chart. Here's your solar system forecast. We show it daily because people are concerned about Venus being in retrograde or something. It does a thing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's exacerbating your relationships and draining your resources or something. So, yeah, uh, that's where things are today. Let's advance this one week. That's where things will be. In a week, we will have a crescent waning moon by that point. And today's astronomy photo of the day. You might think it's a sunrise or a sunset. So let's scroll down. And not at all. That is moonbeams. Yeah, moonbeams by Gianni Domino. Gianni Domino, the supermoon of 2023. By the way, August has a blue moon, and that will be another supermoon, a third for the year 2023, as perigee, the closest approach to the moon, will be occurring. That's apod.nasa.gov. If you want to check it out yourself, apod.nasa.gov, and here come coronagraphs. So this is yesterday's coronagraph imagery from George Mason University. That's 105 frames. We'll let that play through in its entirety. A couple CMEs there. None appear to be earthly directed. Whoops. Let's go forward to today's CMEs. And there may have been one associate. There was one associated with that 420 M-class solar flare. I don't suspect it is earthly directed based on the existing imagery there, but those are, those are only 17 frames. So if that does appear to be an earthly directed CME, we will let you know, probably with another video or maybe on tomorrow's daily space weather. Here's C3 along with the C2, which is what we we're just showing. Does not look like an earthly directed coronal mass ejection from this morning. So just two CMEs this way, one slated to arrive in just a few hours, one slated to arrive late tomorrow night. Universal time. August 4th and August 5th. Friday and Saturday night, great nights for Aurora parties. Make sure you schedule yours. Now, we're going to look at Stereo A, and you know, keep in mind that Stereo A is about to become be Stereo B, and Stereo B is now ahead of Earth, actually. So, those spacecraft are... Stereo B is moving this way. Stereo A is moving this way and slowly overtaking Earth. And uh, it's stereo, stereo A, it stands for ahead, and it's actually about to fall behind seeing space weather, seeing space weather later than what's uh, appearing on Earth. Anyway, here are the latest coronagraphs. This is stereo A over here on the left. And there is that CME from this morning. 
does not appear to have any earthly directed components. It looks like it will miss Earth well to the west. And there's Lasco C3 once again. How about some custom coronagraph videos? Here are our here are our 24-hour videos. And just a bit of a light show there. No earthly directed components. Here's the huge plasma filament I was talking about earlier in the video. It did create one small CME, but it is still suspended there. So uh, you can expect to see additional CMEs coming in the next days. The likelihood of more coronal mass ejections between now and tomorrow's daily space weather video is 99.9%. It's basically 100%. I guess there could be some weird scenario where no additional CMEs happen. Tomorrow's daily space weather video will feature more CMEs. You can mark my words on it. So that's another 24-hour video there, SDO 193 angstroms, and the Soho Lasco C2. Here we'll zoom in a little bit closer, just 193 angstroms, which brings us to filaments. You might be able to see some filaments on that imagery. We showed some earlier in the video. Let's take a look at the hydrogen alpha imagery from El Tide, Spain. So there is El Tide, Spain's ground-based hydrogen alpha telescope. And that is a lot of filaments. So you see all of these dark absorption features like this one here, which is looking increasingly unstable. That's the same area where the uh, August 4th and 5th CMEs came from. Huge filament down here, huge filament here, huge filament here. And a huge filament here and don't forget this one and then there's another there's another so that is a lot of filaments i'll just say that once again likelihood of coronal mass ejections and the possibility of earth directed coronal mass ejections very very high here's 304 angstroms this might be a good wavelength to view filaments as well ionized helium And this filament is still hanging out here, I think, but it is looking increasingly unstable. So expect CMEs, coronal mass ejections, when the sun ejects huge amounts of superheated gas from its atmosphere. And we're almost at our bonus feature segment. Before we do that, if you want to name filaments after living people, don't be an imbecile. Join us over on Twitter. Don't be an imbecile, though. And you can name filaments after living people. Just follow the hashtag name that filament. We also do regularly feature auroral shares. If you've got imagery or something like that you want us to share, or if you want to make fun of people who believe in chemtrails, join us over on Twitter. Hilarious discussions going on over there all the time about delusion and fantasy. So we showed you SDO 304 angstroms. Here's GOES-16 SUVI 304 angstroms. This is just not a 24-hour video. This is just the past about two and a half hours. And it does indeed look like there still is a filament here. There are still plenty of filaments to name. Let's go back briefly here. We're going to bring up the latest image. To make it easier for you people to join us on X, formerly known as Twitter, all over the internet at Smashomash. Name that filament after living people. It seems appropriate because, well, filaments are lively. And uh, so name them after living people. Seems to make sense. Which brings us to our bonus feature segment. Satellite charging hazards are the first thing we'll look at, and there are none. It is smooth sailing for satellites here. No surface or internal charging hazards. No electrons building up on or in satellites. Goes electron flux here very low. And we can expect to see this stay kind of low for the next couple of days. I would not expect an uptick until sometime around Sunday. So sometime like maybe Sunday evening, you can expect to see the electron flux come back up as the ionosphere settles back down. 
There's the one-year graph of the electron flux at about as low as we get. Keep in mind those are essentially erroneous measurements uh, because, again, the ionosphere puffs up and the, uh, the GOES-16 and the GOES-18, they're using radiography to measure the ionosphere, which is the, the F layer at about 300 kilometers of altitude from their near ge geosynchronous orbits. So if the ionosphere puffs up to 400 kilometers, then they're not going to be very well measured, those electrons at the F layer of the ionosphere. So here is the forecast model, and NOAA expecting a further dip in the electron flux there. Uh, that would be a significant, that would be probably the lowest that we've seen. That would be darn close, that would probably be the lowest that we've seen in the entire year. So that's the forecast model, the green box, the yellow diamonds are the observation. We'll also show the vibrational frequency of the F layer. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with those distances in kilometers. And here is the vibrational frequency of the F layer, courtesy of Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology. We are seeing mainly low frequency anomalies, and you can expect to see a lot of red on the anomaly gram on tomorrow and indeed on Sunday's daily space weather videos, so to make sure you don't miss those. Again, sign up for email alerts at smashomash.com slash smash team in order to get notifications straight to your inbox as opposed to relying on completely untrustworthy organizations to notify you when we put out content. By the way, we put out a video just for, we put out a post just for gold smash team members, by the way. That's $9.99 a month for additional content and analysis that nobody else gets to see, including a pre-print explanation of these solar sunspot cycles. Anyway, this is the anomaly gram. That's anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. And we've already got quite a lot of red on here, and you can expect to see a lot more low-frequency anomalies there on tomorrow and Sunday's videos. Bring up the latest image here. There's 11.15 universal time for the, for the ionogram. And there is 11.15 universal time for the anomaly gram. Low frequency anomalies in the northern hemisphere, high frequency in the south. It is winter down there. That is pretty sensible based on the current solar wind parameters and plasma environment surrounding planet Earth. We'll also show the total electron content. That's free electrons from about 12,500 miles of altitude down to your handset. Free electrons cause signal refraction. These are the most likely places to see GPS errors. The coupled thermosphere, ionosphere, electrodynamics. Total electron content model. And things are looking pretty organized here. So less anomalies than we saw a week ago. most of those free electrons there where you'd expect them to be around the equator around noontime. Now, here's a total electron content anomaly from the 10-day average over North America, and we're seeing continued signals here over the Cascadia fault zone. So that could portend a 6-plus magnitude quake in the Cascadia fault zone. We may have already covered the possibility of four shocks happening there. Remember, folks, any earthquake could be a four shock. And if there is an Earth-generated radio signal, that does cause a signal to appear in this space weather data, the total electron content. We would be more than happy to announce the predictive value as the ability to forecast earthquakes would be sweet. We're not suggesting that we are doing it. We're suggesting that there are some science papers out there raising the possibility that it can be done. It's about a four-day window. It's for six-plus magnitude quakes. And I'll let it play through one more time. You can see that signal there around the Cascadia Fault Zone near Vancouver Island. So that's that. And 
we'll end the space weather portion of this video before we go to meteorology and show the latest intensity gram and latest magnetogram. All right, so this new sunspot, it looks like it's pretty weak. Not even a sunspot, just an active region. So I suspect that this sunspot is going to grow, and it's already actually doing that. We're seeing multiple umbrae growing around this main umbra. So that's an indication that there is some activity showing up there in the southeast. New sunspot just rose or formed up here also. Check it out. There's another new sunspot. So... I suspect we're going to see a large uptick on the eastern limb, especially in the southern hemisphere, but clearly also in the northern hemisphere. Anyway, there is your full disk rock back. The most likely place for large solar flares, in my opinion, remains over here on the western limb, but there is a rising possibility on the eastern limb. So that is our space weather segment. And we used to make the meteorology segments. In fact, we used to even make the bonus features separate. But we stopped doing that because guess what happened? It amounted to less views on YouTube. That makes a lot of sense, right? Shorter videos amounted to less views. Yeah, makes total sense. So anyway, now we're looking at ocean currents. So this is the animation is ocean currents. And the color gradation is the speed of the currents. And, you know, Earth has interesting ocean currents that are sort of like a continuous looping system. Of course, this is mainly showing the surface currents. Uh, this does not show deep water currents. It shows surface currents uh, of warmer water. The deep ocean currents are colder water, obviously. And surface currents are largely driven by wind. Deep ocean currents are uh, mainly caused by heat exchange. So, so anyway, those are the ocean currents. And you may hear a lot of people concerned about the AMOC shutting down and things like that. No year without a summer expected for Europe by those of us who are sane when it comes to space weather and meteorology. But that's the ocean current situation. If you've never heard of it, the thermocline circulation is super interesting. Uh, there's an image of it. The blue is the, uh, those are the deep water cold water currents. And of course, this, this one over here is associated with Earth plunging into ice ages every about 60,000 years. The red is the surface, and then, of course, the, the, the purple, that is where you've got uh, an overturning circulation, essentially a vertical circulation where you see those transitions happening. There's a cool animation here also. And you can check out that Wikipedia article yourself if you like. And let's switch to our regularly scheduled meteorology segment. So here is the a jet stream environment for the eastern world. Shout out to our viewers from all around the planet. The jet stream blowing backward there over the western Pacific and the northern Indian Ocean. Here are the surface winds. And if you're viewing the video from this area right here, make sure you press the share button. Since there are like three or four billion people in that tiny area, press the share button. Our exposure to that market is almost nothing. Here are the surface winds of the central world. And here are the jet streams. It looks like a cold day in places like in places like France. Here are the jet streams of the West. And these are the surface winds. Moving right along. And the reason we're showing this is because visibility. Here's a great map from Windy.com. Another reason to use windy.com, you can download the free mobile app for your quote smart and quote device, which is about as smart as a dog's ass and similarly full of crap. It shows visibility. So this might help you if you're 
too lazy to go out and look outside and see if you can see stars in the sky. Visibility map might help you figure out whether or not the aurora will be visible at your location from witty.com, so maybe check that out. Windy.com, it's not a paid affiliate or sponsor. It's just some good advice. Here's clouds and fog over the Americas. Depicted by shortwave radiation, the NASA GOES interactive weather satellite. Some rapid cloud nucleation happening here around the Missouri-Kentucky border. Here's your smoke map forecast. And there is going to be quite a bit of smoke here, especially in places like Idaho, Oregon, and Washington but also some smoke coming down from Canada once again. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, Chicago, Michigan, etc. That is your firesmoke.ca forecast. Quite a few fires in the eastern U.S. as well as the Pacific Northwest. Next, your weather.gov map. If your location is lit up on the map, just click your location at weather.gov. Since you're viewing this video on the internet, you can probably access a website, smashomash.com or weather.gov. We showed the key. There's lots of flooding appearing on the map in severe weather in places like Missouri, Tennessee, and Alabama. Here's your forecast. We'll start out with the flood forecast because, well, that is the thing to, that's the most urgent thing, right? So some major flooding there stretching all the way from North Carolina down to the Florida, northern Florida there. Uh, some areas there expecting over four inches of rain. So that's a GFS 72 hour total accumulated precipitation forecast in inches. Here is your GFS pressure and precipitation forecast as some severe weather is currently moving through Tennessee down toward the southeast. And here is your temperature anomaly forecast since there are plenty of uh, excessive heat advisories. Most of the north central country there seeing excessively low temperatures. The south central part of the country seeing excessively high temperatures. That is a 72 hour GFS temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. Next, Lightning Mapper. Check out the extreme lightning conflagration happening there in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama especially. That is serious lightning. And let's see where the current strikes are here at lightningmaps.org. Next time you hear thunder, highly recommend it. You'll be able to forecast thunderclaps and convince people that you're Zeus or something like that. Frighten the natives by forecasting thunder. It's a good time. Birmingham, Alabama there is a uh, just southwest of that cell. This cell up here is uh, uh, near Dyersburg. And more cells here. It's a long chain of chain lightning. Ozark National Forest's got thunder rolling in. That is a severe thunderstorm there. That is a lot of very concentrated lightning activity. There's the full world map. Keep in mind the coverage map does not cover everything. There is a way to show that. You can show the whether the, where the stations are located if you like. Lightningmaps.org, again, highly recommended. And it's highly recommended that you press like, subscribe, and share. As uh, these videos don't seem to get onto people's screens for some reason, I guess facts are very controversial. After all, it is 2023, and the past three years have featured... I just blew myself off. The last three years have certainly featured a complete lack of accountability, responsibility, as certain bureaucrats are unable to get out of their own way or do their own job. Press like, subscribe, and share. Tell your friends and foes about the channel. Perhaps support the channel by doing stuff like visiting our websites, hitting us up on social media. If you've unplugged entirely from social media, we don't blame you. Since you've discovered the video, welcome to the Neo Renaissance. You want some original music? There's even a link to our Spotify there. 
We're also on Amazon Music and iTunes and all over the internet at Smash Mash. Golden Cat Productions is the record label, by the way. And if you want to support the channel and get additional content, become a member of the Smash Team. Smashomash.com slash Smash Team is our official subscription services site. We launched that back in October of 2021 because we realized we needed more capabilities than Patreon. So thanks especially to our gold annual paid up subscribers, also our gold subscribers, silver subscribers, and last but not least, the bronze level Smash Team members. Most of you get most email alerts, although there is some content only for silver level, only for gold level, etc. Gold level gets access to everything that we put out and uh, silver level additional content, but less than less than gold and bronze level, even less than that. Things like disaster alerts get sent out to everybody. So we send out tsunami alerts regularly here at the Smash News Network before USGS does and also alerts about space weather. So. Get those sent directly to your inbox instead of relying on extremely unreliable and untrustworthy organizations to notify you when we put up content by becoming a member of the Smash Team. We'll close out this mother. And by the way, thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network, least busted name and news, with the latest U.S. Doppler radar. Also clouds and fog, and also water vapor. We show it daily on the channel as we zoom in to the lower 48. So here's a quick look at these strong storms. The strongest storms there are approaching Jackson. As we produce the video, keep in mind this was not streamed live. This was a re recorded video. Here is clouds and fog. You can see that rapid cloud nucleation once again happening there around Missouri, western Kentucky, and western Tennessee. Here you'll see a lot of water vapor there appearing on the map. That's the water vapor map, 6.19 micrometer infrared radiation. Huge pressure gradients forming there over northern Mississippi and Alabama. As that system moves, it looks like, I would say, south-southeast. It looks more south than southeast. Anyway, here's the recap. Doppler radar. And by the way, if your Doppler radar is unclear, look at clouds and fog. And if it's still unclear, the water vapor map should clear things up, especially if you understand things like low pressure systems are actually less massive than high pressure systems. So this dry mass of air down there, that is a relative high. This is a relative high pressure. This is a relative high pressure. This is a relative low pressure. And these areas where you see these huge pressure gradients are where you get precipitation and people thinking that they're seeing chemtrails a non-existent feature of the sky. Anyway, thanks for tuning in once again to the Smash News Network, least busted name and news. Congratulations on realizing the channel exists. Don't get in your bunker. There's no reason to get in your bunker because, well, space probably isn't going to kill you. These things have been, the planets have been doing what they're doing, folks, for billions of years. So if you're frightened of planets, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's not bunker worthy. So get out and make hay while the sun shines. And it does. In the meantime, I'll, I'll have been your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back.